was preparing to return to America. He was a poet growing in international fame. And as he prepared to return home, he wrote a poem that he later insisted was simply a joke, a funny story, something that he wrote to amuse a friend of his. And yet that composition that he penned became one of the best loved poems of the 20th century. You, no doubt you probably have read it in high school English. It begins like this, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other just as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden back black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The poet was a man by the name of Robert Frost, his poem is known as The Road Not Taken. And after he achieved his fame, he always insisted that this poem was kind of an inside joke between him and another friend. And yet it is remembered and studied and memorized because all of us have been there. We love this poem because we've been there. We've all come to crossroads in life where two roads diverged, one this way and one that way and we stood at the crossroads and we wondered should we go this way or should we go that way we know that once the decision is made we can never really go back and make it over again and it's the last line that catches the mind two roads diverged in a wood and i i took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference our decisions really do matter. We make our decisions and then our decisions turn around and then they make us. We face so many questions in life. Should I get married? And if I should get married, should I date this girl or that girl or should I date this guy or that guy? Should I continue my studies or look into grad school? And if I should, should I stay at the school that I'm currently at or should I go somewhere else and what major should I study? I've been offered a new job and it's a good job but I've already got a good job. Should I take the new job or should I hold on to the one that I already have? We already have children but we're thinking about having another one. Should we have another one? Is God calling me to the mission field? If so, where is he calling me? And how can I be sure that it is God that is calling me? We make our decisions, and our decisions then turn around and make us two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at God's word about what it has to say about finding God's will for our life. That's an important statement I just made. It's important because the Bible is a book about God's will. It's a book that explains to us who God is, how he works, and how he relates to all of his people. It explains not just general principles, but shows us clearly over and over and over again, not only does God guide his people, but exactly how God guides his people. And so what I'm hoping this morning to offer you is something that will be both biblical and both practical to all of you that are facing major decisions and are wondering what to do. 
No question is more basic than, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you remember when Saul met Jesus on the Damascus Road? He asked him one simple question, Lord, what do you want me to do? It's the most basic question a Christian can ask. Lord, what is your will for my life? Lord, what do you want me to do? Which way do you want me to go? If you're a new Christian, you ask this. Whenever you see someone come to Jesus for the first time, almost inevitably the question they want to know is, what is God's will and how do I discover it and how do I do it? College students ask the same questions. UTD students, SMU students, DTS students, they all ask the same questions. You're at a crossroads. And it's not just one road this way and one road this way. It's like five different roads and seven roads this way and five roads that way. And you want to know, God, which way are you leading me? What are you calling me to do? Those of us who have graduated, who are a little older, who already have a career, especially those of us who are at that midlife transition point in life, and I'm sad to say I am there now at that midlife time. We look back at all that we've done over the last 10, 15 years, and now we're wondering, are we on the right track? Are we doing exactly what God called us to do? Are we doing God's will for our life? What about those who are facing retirement age? They ask the same question. Numerous occasions I've encountered people, folks in their 50s, 60s, who are healthy, active, and still want to serve Jesus. It's, and they'll say things like, I've got 10 years or 15 years left, and I want these years to count for Jesus. I want these to be the best years of my life. How can I discover what God's will is for my life? Beyond all of that, there is a more fundamental question for us to consider. If you are a follower of Jesus, in your better moments, you want to please him. You want to honor him. You want to do that which is most important in God's eyes. Deep in your heart, you really want to seek first the kingdom of God. And only if you knew what God wanted, you would be glad to do it. I think all of us have some fear in our life that we will come to the end of life and we'll look back at all that we've done and we'll feel that we wasted what was given to us. I think we fear that someday we'll stand before God and he'll say, you did a very good job, but you didn't do what I wanted you to do. We all have that secret fear that someday God will say, you did a good job but you didn't do your very best. So there's no question of discovering God's will will touch the ultimate issues of life. Perhaps you could say there is nothing more important for you to know than what is God's will for your life. There's another reason for to dive into this topic. All of us have a personal interest because even for me, I've agonized many times over God, what's your will in my life? I realize that who I am today is a result of hundreds of decisions I've made in life from a very young age till now, and who I am today is a result of those decisions. Hundreds and hundreds of decisions, many of which, when I made them, didn't seem very important at the time. For instance, when junior year of high school, I'm a pastor's kid, so... I was forced to do church every week, yet um, all through high school I lived in rebellion against God. But in my junior year of high school, the Holy Spirit began to convict me while I was leading worship. I used to lead worship, believe it or not. Um, not anymore. Um, God knew I, couldn't do, I wasn't doing a really good job at that. But in the middle of leading worship, God just began to convict me of my sins. And I handed my mic off to someone else that was singing ran to the bathroom of my church and surrendered my life to God in a bathroom stall. A decision that I made that has impacted my life for the rest of my life. Grew up in, a, in Philadelphia and things were going well and I was very active in church and all of a sudden a door closed in my life at a school that I was going to and had to make a decision to either go to community college or go to another school in 
within a week ended up moving out of Philly to move to Oklahoma and spent seven years of my life in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a decision that impacted my life, for the, impacted the rest of my life. And then while there, my first year there, had an opportunity to be able to go back home for the summer or spend the entire summer doing a missions trip in India. And I thought, hey, this is a fun opportunity. Let me go and spend two months in India. And so I did that. And while there, the pastor that we were working with took us to one of the largest Hindu temples um, in the country. And we watched as women threw their grain and their money at these idols in the hopes that these idols would give them children. And there, as I stood there, I realized that God was calling me to serve him full time, a decision that has impacted the rest of my life. And so came back and finished my undergrad degree in accounting which, and thought, I just wasted all of my life, my last four years of my life doing accounting. I'll never do this because God's called me to the mission field. And little did I know that once I graduated that my accounting degree would, what, would be what kept me sustained um, as a family for the next several years and even now, a decision that has impacted the rest of my life. And then to quit the job that I had to go to seminary and study and then become a youth pastor and then meet a girl that was born in Dubai, moved to Dallas and meet her, fall in love, get married, and think that we're going to move back to Philly to live there um, and serve at a church that I already had a youth pastor position lined up for, but she was an international student. They wouldn't let her transfer, and so we said, hey, we'll live in Dallas for three months. Um, she'll finish her semester, and we'll move to Philly, and three months has now become 13 years, and we'll still hear a decision that has impacted the rest of my life. And then while we were here, we began to attend a church that we deeply loved and got involved in, plugged in. And then several years into it, we had to make a hard decision to move out of that church um, for various reasons. And that decision has made me who I am. And then a decision to start a Bible study in my home about 10 years now. And that Bible study evolved into a Sunday night Bible study and then Five years ago this year, that evolved into a Sunday morning worship, and all of us are in this room because of a decision to start a simple Bible study that God took and evolved and evolved. See, our decisions, we make our decisions, and our decisions turn around, and, we, and they make us. We are who we are because we've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small decisions in our life, and they have turned around and made us into who we are this morning. You make your decisions and then your decisions turn around and make you. Those of you who are doctors, you didn't just wake up and become a doctor. You made decisions to go to school and study and um, pass your board exams and get licensed and become a professional. Those of you who work, you didn't just happen to wake up and say, hey, I'm gonna do this this morning. You made decisions and decisions and decisions that made you into who you are this morning. Our decisions make us. There are many different ways that we could ask the question this morning. You can ask, how can I, a mere mortal, ever discover what the Almighty God wants me to do? Or you can ask it this way. How can I bring God into the reality of my daily life? Or you can ask it this way. Where is God when I have to make a really tough decision. Or you could ask it this way, does God still guide? In the moments of life when you have to make a tough decision, when you're in the woods with two roads diverging in front of you and going two different ways, one this way and one that way, can you count on God to help you? I want to share a verse with you that's been a verse that has encouraged me so much over the last several years. Psalms 48, 14 says, This is our God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. I discovered this about eight years ago when I was in a desperate moment of my life. I lost my job unexpectedly when the owner of the company that I was working for, the ministry that I was working for, called us into his office and told us that he had a moral failure and he had to step down, and the place within a week shut down. I had no backup plan, lost my job. I had a, a wife, a baby, 
and a mortgage payment, and I had nothing to count on. And when I was desperately needing to know what God wanted me to do, this verse became so precious to me. This God is my God, and he will be our guide forever. I discovered that this verse is true. He will be our guide. He will be our guide whether we believe it or not, whether we see it or not, whether we know it or not. He will be our guide. It doesn't matter whether you believe it. It doesn't matter whether you know it or understand it or comprehend it. He has promised to be your guide. The verse says this guide, this God. What God is this? It's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, the God of the Bible, the God who led his people through the wilderness, the God of the nation of Israel. This God will be our God forever and ever. This God, the God of the Bible, will be our God even to the end. There are many places in the Bible that you can go to find this illustrated. But I was thinking about it this week. This one story kept coming back to me. It's a story that grips our imagination, the story that, for me, most clearly shows the guidance of God for his people is a story about a cloud and a pillar of fire. And you can find this story in both Exodus 13 and Numbers 9. Let me give you a little background. The nation of Israel has just left Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea, and they're going toward Mount Sinai. And eventually, they're going to come to the Promised Land. And as they were leaving the safety and security of Egypt, something amazing happens. Exodus 13 tells it this way, they were leaving Succoth and they camped and eat them at the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, in a pillar of fire to guide them by light so that they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of cloud by night, fire by night left its place in front of the people. The desert is behind them. The Red Sea's ahead of them and now the Egyptians are chasing them the people are scared to death because all they've known their entire life was Egypt and Pharaoh and as bad as that was at least they felt secure there but what will they do now that they're leaving their security behind them and they don't know what the future holds and God shows up and answers their concerns by moving a pillar to guide them along the way during the day, the pillar was a visible cloud that they could see in the sky. At night, that cloud became a blazing pillar of fire. This provided visible, unmistakable guidance 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All they had to do was follow the cloud and the fire, and they would be safe. There's a remarkable passage in Numbers 9 that explains how the pillar of fire actually worked. The passage is a bit long, and I believe it's behind me, but I'll find the details of this fascinating. Let me read this for you. Numbers 9, 15 to 23. On that day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And at evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud lifted over the tent, after that the people of Israel set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out, and at the command of the Lord they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then, according to the command of the Lord, they set out. Sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, and when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days, a month, or a longer time that the cloud continued over the tabernacle abiding there, the people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped, and at the command of the Lord, they, kept, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord, 
at the command of the Lord by Moses. From this passage, I want to give you four lessons about the cloud and the fire that explains to us something about how God guides his people. Number one, God's guidance is revealed to us one step at a time. God's guidance is revealed to us one step at a time. Numbers 9 makes that very clear. The cloud would lift, they would go. As long as the cloud kept moving, they would follow. When it stopped, they would stop. Sometimes the cloud would just stop for a night. And they would, in the morning, they would get up and they see the cloud moving and they would go. Sometimes it would stop for a few days and they would rest for a few days. The Israelites never knew from moment to moment or day to day what the cloud was going to do next. See, it's precisely at this point we have our number one problem with knowing the will of God in our lives. To us, knowing the will of God means discovering the future. We want to know, we want God to unscroll the scroll of life before us so we could see the whole thing laid out before us. But you know, God doesn't normally work like that. Normally, that's not how God operates. Let me clarify. I absolutely believe that God has a blueprint for all of our lives. But I don't think there's any way you and I can get a copy of that blueprint. I think the way that God guides us today is exactly the way that God guided the people back in the Old Testament, day by day, step by step. One of the most important verses in the whole Bible is Psalm 109, Psalm 119, 105. It says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light unto my path. And the picture there is a man walking in darkness with a lamp to light his, light his path. How far could he see in front of him? I'm going to illustrate this for a second. If you can turn the lights down for one second. Oh, look at that. These guys are good. Um, there we go. So here's this lamp. See, most of us, what we want, if I can get my lamp working, most of us, what we want, We want to see all the way up there. We want to show, God, show me where I'm going to be five years from now. Show me where I'm going to be ten years from now. The problem with looking up there is that you can't see what's right in front of you. And the danger there is when you're up there, you can trip and fall over things. But how does God guide? One step at a time. You take a step, where does the light go? One step ahead. You take another step, where does the light go? Another step ahead of you. Take one step, where does the light go? Another step ahead of you. One step, another step ahead of you. And eventually, you'll look back and you'll say, man, I used to be there, but all of a sudden I'm here. How did that happen? You just took one step and one step and one step. How does God guide? One step at a time. He sometimes will tell you this is where you're going to be, but oftentimes he just says, here's your next step. Take it. Here's your next step. Take it. Here's your next step. Take it. That's the way God guides us. You can turn it back on. He guides us one step at a time. And as we take another step, he shows us what's next. This light is a light of God's guidance. So many of us, we get tripped up and we fall because we want to see what's 10 steps ahead of us. And we're so busy trying to focus on what's way ahead of us that we miss opportunities and things that God wants us to do that's right here because we're so busy caught up with what's out there. And God says, take one step. Serve here. Be faithful here. And when you're ready, I'll show you what the next step is. And when you're ready there, I'll show you what the next step is. You will get there. You'll get to exactly where I want you to be. But you're not going to jump from here to there overnight. It's going to happen one step at a time. You're going to go moment by moment, day by day. Sometimes I'm going to make you wait here for a little while. 
Sometimes I'm going to show you what's next right away. You just got to trust that where you are is exactly where God wants you to be. The light that the psalmist talks about is God's guidance. God rarely guides you 10 steps in advance. He normally leads you step by step by step. He'll lead you a step, and then he'll lead you another step, and then he'll lead you another step. He normally reveals a step by step, just as he did with the, the cloud and the fire. One day at a time. One day we're moving, next day we're staying. Then we're moving, then we're staying. God's guidance is revealed to us one step at a time. Lesson number two. God's guidance demands our obedience, whether we like it or not. God's guidance demands our obedience, whether we like it or not. You read Numbers 9, the author there sounds very frustrated. He sounds kind of annoyed with the fact that some days God wants us to just sit here for a while. And we want to move, but God doesn't want to move. Some days we're ready to move and God just wants us to stay. I get the feeling that he is incredibly frustrated when he's writing this. He goes into great pains in Numbers 9 to let us know sometimes how the cloud would move suddenly and then sometimes it would stop suddenly without any particular explanation. We would stay somewhere for a long, long time, the author's saying, and then suddenly, all of a sudden, we'd get up and start moving. And then we would stay somewhere, someplace else for a long time, and then we would move. And then we would stop for one night, and then we'd move again. Many days, it didn't make sense at all. God's guidance is like that. Sometimes, God keeps you moving when you would rather stop. You get to a place in your life, and you're happy, and you're settled, you're content, you have a job, you have your family, you have money, and you have everything going for you. Your kids are happy in school, you like your neighbors, work is going well, you enjoy your church, life is good, and so you say, God, let's just camp here for a little while. Let's just enjoy this place for a little while. And the next morning you wake up and the cloud is moving. And the cloud is going. And you say, God, what are you doing? I'm happy here. I'm content here. Everything is going well. Let's stay here. And God says, we're moving. If you're going to follow me, you'll have to keep moving as well. Can you imagine what it was like to wander in the wilderness for 40 years? You're in year 23, 17 more years to go. And for about the last four years, all you've been doing is going in a circle. And it seems like you haven't gone anywhere. And finally, the cloud stops, and they call this place, suck at the, the desert of Zin. It's hot, it's rocky, it's barren, it's dusty, and there's not a sign of life for miles ahead. And the cloud has finally stopped. So you start to set up your tent you get your tent up and you put some rocks to make a temporary uh, covering for your sheep. You think to yourself, well, it looks like we're going to be here for a while. There's an oasis over there over that hill where the animals can get some water and you're going to get comfortable. And the next morning you wake up and you look out and the cloud is moving. And that makes you mad. What are you talking about, God? We just got here. We're finally settling down. We just got the sheep fed. I just put the tents up. I just took my sandals off. God, what are you doing? And the Lord said, what I'm doing is I'm moving. And if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to move with me. There's an old southern gospel song that says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We're pilgrims. We're passing through. And sometimes we're moving when we'd rather be saying. But listen, the opposite is also true. Sometimes you want to move and God says stay. Sometimes you want to say, God, that's enough of this place. Show me what's next. And God says, no, I want you to stay here for just a little while. Sometimes the cloud and the pillar would stay in the same place for days or weeks or months or maybe even a year. Don't know. But the people would get antsy and say, let's go, let's move, let's go to what's next. And they wake up and the cloud is never moving, it's just staying there. We live in a proactive generation that says, let's move, let's go, let's do this, let's get us done. And sometimes God says, no, you're going to stay right where you are. 
Sometimes God says wait when we'd rather move. Chuck Swindoll says that waiting is the hardest discipline of the Christian life. It's hard. That's why the psalmist says, be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. That's why Isaiah would write, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So get this principle down, the second lesson down, and get it down clearly. God's guidance demands our obedience, whether we like it or not, whether it makes sense or not. Sometimes God moves when we want to stay, and sometimes God stays when we want to move. But if you want to stay close to God, you've got to stay as close to the cloud as possible. Lesson number three, God's guidance changes its character according to the need of the moment. During the day, the people of Israel needed to see a cloud. When they saw the cloud, they knew that they were in the right direction. But at night, the cloud would be invisible. So the cloud looked like fire. God had one way of showing himself to the people during the day and another way of showing himself to the people during the night. That leads me to this conclusion. God's guidance is always there, but the means of his guiding us changes from moment to moment. Think about the implications of that statement. God is not obligated to guide you the same way he guides someone else. God is not obligated to speak to you the same way he speaks to someone else. We can go take it even further. God is not obligated to deal with you today the same way that he dealt with you yesterday or the way that he's going to deal with you tomorrow. See, that's an important principle to learn because many of us want to put God in a box. We think that since God dealt with us this way or my best friend in this way, therefore he's got to deal with me in the same way. Lord, you answered her prayer that way, but now you've got to answer my prayer the exact same way. And God says, no deal. He's God. We're not. Right, Roger? You can't put God in a box. How does God guide his people? Sometimes it could be through a dream or a vision. Sometimes it could be just reading God's word. God guides you. Sometimes it could be through the advice of good Christian friends. Sometimes it could be through prayer. Sometimes by these impressions that we get on our heart. Sometimes through these inner convictions. Sometimes by a deep sense of inner peace. Sometimes by looking at all the circumstances of life that clearly point in one direction. Sometimes he simply gives us a simple wisdom to make the right decisions. Sometimes he will speak to us. Sometimes he guides us by his silence. Very often it's a combination of all of those things. You know why it's important that you understand that? Because our God is infinitely creative. God can make billions of snowflakes, and no two of them are exactly alike. If God can do that, he is able to lead each of us individually in exactly the way we need to go. Listen, God is committed to guiding you this year. He is committed to leading you. He's committed to showing you where you need to be. And, may, and his methods may change, but don't forget he is committed to guiding you. He's absolutely committed to leading you. Sometimes you might not like it the way he guides you, but he is committed to leading you exactly where he wants you to be. Lesson number four. God's guidance is revealed to us as we stay close to him. God's guidance is revealed to us as we stay close to him. In the Old Testament, the cloud and the pillar, they represent the very presence of God. They weren't just symbols. They represented God's presence with his people. We read in the Old Testament that the Lord spoke from a cloud. So when the people saw the cloud, they would understand that God himself was leading them. Do you know what that means? That means that the cloud went north and you went south, you were going to get in trouble. If the cloud started moving and you said, you know what, I'm just going to stay here just a few more days because I'm comfortable, 
you were going to be in trouble. If the cloud stayed and you decided to go ahead of it, you would be in trouble. Why? Because you were moving away from the presence of God. The only thing you can do is turn around and come back. You know what that tells me? Knowing the will of God for your life is not a matter of geography. It's not a question of where you should go or what you should do. Knowing the will of God is not about who you should marry or when you should get married. It's not about whether you take this job or that job or how many kids you should have or where you should go to school or whether you should be a missionary or not. These are important questions, but these are secondary questions. The primary question is this. Are you willing to follow God wherever he leads? Are you willing to follow God wherever he leads you? It's a spiritual question. And that's the question that we've got to ask ourselves for this year. Not God, what are you revealing to me? But God, am I willing to follow you wherever you lead me this year? When we say to God, show me what to do, the Lord says, just stay close to me. Just stay close to me. We cry out to the heavens, God, I'm scared. And God says, follow me. We say, God, give me some answers. And God looks at you and says, give me your heart. Give me your heart. See, that's what we have to ask ourselves this year. God, do you have my heart? Do you have all of my heart? Am I willing to follow you wherever you lead me? Or am I going to be the type that tries to dictate to you where to go and try to force you to follow me? Because God is not going to follow you. When you try to do your own decisions, you are moving away from the cloud, moving away from the presence. And it is there that you are in danger. You want to know God's will? Stay close to him. Stay close to his heart. Stay close to the fire. Stay close to the cloud. That's why I love the ending of Numbers 9. It says, at the Lord's command, they stayed At the Lord's command, they went out. See, if you will do the same thing in this new year, God will guide you. If the Lord says stop, you will stop. If the Lord says go, you will go. He will guide you. It is a moral and spiritual issue. The secret of knowing God's will ultimately is knowing God. And as you get to know God better, he will reveal his will to you. What does that do for our decision making? I think it means that when you need to know, you will know. And that when the time comes for you to make a decision, you will have everything you need to make that decision. The issue is not mystical superstition. The issue is, am I ready to follow God? Am I ready to stay close to him? Am I willing to put the Lord first in everything, more than anything else in life? Because if I will seek first the kingdom of God, everything else, everything else, my studies, my future, my marriage, my family, my children, my finances, everything else, they will be taken care of. Does God still guide? Yes, he does. The ultimate proof that we serve a God who guides is Jesus. He came to this earth to do the Father's will. And as he approached the cross, he struggled with the will of God. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried in agony, God, if it is possible, would you take this cup from me? But then he makes a statement. He says, nevertheless, 
not my will, but your will. Did Jesus do the will of God? Look at the form, the dying form of the Son of Man on the cross. Beaten, bruised, rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. When he died, his life appeared to have been wasted, but from that waste came your salvation and my salvation. And from that waste we receive the bread of life. Does God still guide? Yes, he does. How does he guide? Step by step. Listen, I know that doesn't answer all of your questions, but it does answer the main question. This week, when you set out to do the things that you do, can you count on God to be there with you? Yes, you can. This year, when you dream and plan the things that you have for your life this year, can you count on God to be there with you? Yes, you can. Do you know this morning, as we begin this year, you can go forth with confidence. Go forth, child of God, with your head held high. Go forth into the world and do the will of God because God is willing to guide you if you are willing to follow. How can you be so sure? Because the Bible says so. For this God, our God, will be our guide to the end forever. He will be our guide. As we look into this new year and everything that is ahead of us, the one thing that we can be confident in, that as long as we stay close to the presence of God, as long as we say, God, I am willing to do whatever you tell me to do, whether I like it or not, the one thing we can be confident in is he will guide us exactly where he wants us to be. The road wasn't easy. Sometimes they had to stay at places where they didn't want to stay for a long, long time. Sometimes when they wanted to rest, God says, no, you're not resting, you're moving. It wasn't easy, but at the end they reached exactly where God wanted them to be. This same God will be your guide this year. I don't know what your future holds. I don't know what this year holds. I don't know what this year holds for my life, for the life of this church, for each of your individual lives, but I know this. This God who was faithful back then is the same God that will be faithful today. He will be absolutely faithful. He will lead you. He will guide you. And you can be confident as you stay close to him. He will order your steps. Can I encourage you more than anything else this year, make it your goal that you want to pursue God, that you want to love God, you want to be close to God, not for any other agenda, not for any other reason, but you just want to be intimate with God. And as you do that, he will take you exactly where he wants you to be. Many of us simply want God to answer our prayers, our requests, and do things the way we want him to do it. That's not our God. That's not how he operates. Instead of trying to force God to do the things that you want him to do in your life, can you make a decision this morning that, God, I am going to pursue you. I am going to love you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be close to you no matter what it means in my life. If it means things turn out exactly the way I planned, praise be to God. If it means it doesn't turn out the way I planned it, praise be to God because you know what's better for my life than I know. This morning as we come to the communion table, we come because Jesus followed the will of God all the way to the cross. For Jesus it meant he lost everything. But because he followed and lost everything, it means that we have gained everything. We are sons and daughters of Almighty God. We belong to Jesus. We are no longer aliens and strangers and outcasts, but he calls you son, he calls you daughter, and you can call him father. You can go to him anytime you want, with any need you want, with any request you want. Why? Because Jesus, in being obedient to the will of God, 
lost his life so that you can have life. As you come to the table this morning, I pray that you would come with an attitude of saying, God, I want to be close to you. I want to be so close to the cloud that when I see the cloud move, I want to move. Whether I like it or not, I want to move. And when I see the cloud stay, I want to stay. Because I trust that you know what you're doing. I trust that you know exactly what you have planned for my life and you will bring it to fruition. We've been mixing up communion the last several weeks. If you see our little cups aren't there anymore, when you come up, I'm going to invite you to take some time to just meditate and worship. When you come up to take communion, take a piece of bread. You can dip it into the cup and eat it right there and then go back to your seats right at the front. Don't drink from the cup. I know some of us grew up in churches where we all drank from the same cup. That's not what we're wanting to do this morning. Um, Just take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, thank God for Jesus, and then you can go back to your seats we'll worship Jesus together. Father, we thank you that even though we don't know what this year holds, we know that because we belong to you, you are guiding us every step of the way. We can wake up every morning knowing that we serve a God who is actively, daily involved in our lives. You don't leave us to our own but you who began a good work in us, you are faithful to complete it. So this morning we come and we pray, God, whatever that may be, let it be. If you call us to stay, let us stay trusting you. If you call us to go, let us go trusting you. But Father, keep us close to you. Help us not to run away from the cloud. Help us not to think that we know better than you. Help us not to think that we can go our own way and get there faster, but help us to stay as close to you as possible this year. I pray that as a church, that more than anything about getting agendas done or programs done, that our heart would be that we would stay so close to you. That we would want to hear your heart that we would want to do exactly what you call us to do when you call us to do it. And as we do that, that you would take care of all the other details of life. As we come to this table, we thank you that on the cross, the body of Jesus was broken. The blood was spilled. And that when we eat this bread this morning that represents the body of Jesus and when we drink this juice that represents the blood of Jesus, we thank you that you did everything for us so that we can be your children. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.